everyone, and a very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us for Arthritis Talks, Arthritis in the Hips. I'm Dr. Sean Bevan, Chief Science Officer at Arthritis Society Canada. We've come together for this event from many different places, and I would just like to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which I am located on and on which our Toronto office stands. And this is the traditional territories of the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe, Huron-Wendat, and Haudenosaunee Indigenous peoples. Today, this is a meeting place to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, and I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to live with my family and work on this land. Now, given that the hip is so commonly affected by arthritis and is one of the largest weight bearing joints in our bodies, when it is affected by arthritis, it often brings a variety of challenges. So with the help of our experts, Dr. Parth Lodia and Marie, Dr. Marie Westby, tonight we will answer many of your questions about arthritis in the hip. So before we get started, just a few logistics. First, this webinar is best viewed on a laptop or desktop computer. If you have technical difficulties, please email arthritistalks at arthritis.ca for assistance. If you have a question for one of our presenters, you can submit it through the Q&A button at the bottom middle of the screen. And we'll try to get to as many questions as possible during the hour that we have together. You can also click on the chat icon on the bottom middle of the screen to access the chat and connect with other participants, as well as our chat moderator from Arthritis Society Canada. Now, if you find that um, distracting and like to close the chat completely, just click the red X icon to close out of the window. We're also pleased to continue to provide captioning of our webinars to accommodate the diverse needs of our audience. So you'll see that running along the bottom of the page. So many questions that we received in advance follow similar themes. So we will address those first and then go into a live Q&A at the end of our session. And before we get started, I have to thank our event partners, Pfizer, United Way Winnipeg, and our other financial partners for their support of our Arthritis Talk series. So with that, let's get started and a very warm welcome to today's experts who are both joining us from British Columbia, orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Parth Lodia, and clinical physiotherapist and PhD, Dr. Marie Westby. Dr. Lodia, let's start with you. First of all, why is the hip so prone to arthritis? Thank you so much for having me on this. So before we tackle this, we sort of want to know what the hip joint consists of. And here's a brief diagram of the hip joint. The hip joint is the second largest weight bearing joint, just second only to the knee. And what it is, is a ball and socket joint with the socket formed by part of the pelvic bone that we call the acetabulum and the upper end or head of the thigh bone, which is the femur as the ball and called the femoral head. In between is smooth, slippery cartilage covers that, that, that surface the ball and socket. It pads and protects the bone, allowing them to move easily. And with arthritis, which is a degenerative joint disease, the cartilage wears away over time and the bone ends start to get rough and the space in the joint narrows with less cartilage. The bone rubs against each other and the bone spurs grow and that can start causing pain. Addition, in addition to this, what we see on the diagram is also a few ligaments as well as the labrum. The acetabular labrum is a cartilage ring shown in pink surrounding the socket and it provides nutrition to the joint, makes it a much more stable joint and creates uh, smooth motion around the joint and creates a nice seal. The ligamentum teres actually attaches one bone to the other and is an embryonic remnant, but does impart some stability as well. And finally, there is the transverse acetabular ligament at the bottom, which orients the socket. So with that in mind, when we look at the causes of hip arthritis, this can be a multifactorial issue. It can be because of manageable issues and non-changeable issues. Age, family history play a significant role in arthritis. Inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and ankylosing spondylitis also add to this problem. You can have an injury to the hip joint that can also injure the cartilage and deteriorates it. Increased BMI or obesity can add to it. As you can see, due to physics, the increased loads on the cartilage can cause trauma to it as well. And then finally, some altered morphology of the hip 
like dysplasia, impingement, or other childhood conditions can add to this. And I'll just briefly add a little bit more to this last part, which is where some of my expertise comes in. Oftentimes I get asked, what is hip impingement? Well, it is femoral acetabular impingement, which can be divided into pincer and cam. Pincer is where you have a socket that is deep and it can prematurely hit the femoral side, creating pain as well as dis discomfort and also tearing off the labrum. Cam, on the other hand, is when there is oblong shaped femoral head where the femoral head is misshapen and can actually again prematurely hit the socket and again can this time cause injury to the cartilage as well as the labrum. On the other side, I'm sorry, is hip dysplasia, where one can have an abnormally shallow socket. We see on the left-hand side, that's the normal hip. And on the right-hand side, the arrow shows the absence of the covering of the femoral head or the socket. This makes it a very shallow socket, and it can also predispose people to early arthritis in these particular conditions. That's great, Dr. Lodia. Um, Dr. Westby, let's turn it over to you if we could. Is there anything people can be doing to maintain healthy function of their hip joint? Great, thank you. So that was a great overview. And I think what's really important to remember when you, when you saw that picture of the hip joint is that cartilage that Dr. Lodia showed you that covers the end of the femur or the ball. Um, and lines the inside or the cup, it relies on movement, weight bearing um, um, in order to get its nutrition. So cartilage doesn't have its own nerve supply, doesn't have its own blood supply. So my first point to maintain good joint health is to stay active and to move. When we sit for prolonged periods, we're bearing weight um, through that cartilage and through the bone and not um, doing that cyclic loading and unloading that's necessary for good nutrition to the joint. Another tip I find a lot of people who have hip arthritis talk about uh, stiffness and difficulty getting out of bed in the morning. So I refer to this as morning move. So I often suggest people um, sit up, um, move their hips back and forth, roll them in and out, uh, lift their knees up and down and almost prepare the hips for weight bearing or for your load in the morning before you get up. So that can actually be quite helpful. Maintaining a healthy weight is really important. We know that um, when you're walking, you put about 2.5 or two and a half times your body weight through your hips with every step you take. So if you think of being even say uh, 10 pounds or four and a half kilograms overweight, that's another 25 pounds of force that you're putting through your hips with each step. And that goes up even more when you're doing things like using stairs where you can put as much as six times your body weight through your hips. Another strategy for maintaining your hip function is to know what triggers. Again, in that diagram of the hip, you can get arthritis on either the, the ball side or the socket side in different positions. It's not necessarily covering the entire joint. And so knowing which positions um, are triggers or cause the most pain, whether it's sitting at a certain angle or leaning to one side or certain positions you stand in and avoiding those positions or unloading that painful part of the hip joint can be really helpful. And just avoiding prolonged sitting, squatting, standing, anything in one um, prolonged position for a long time is helpful. We usually recommend seeing a physiotherapist. If you find your um, strategies that, um, such as doing your own exercises and being active, uh, using walking poles like this lady is doing in the picture, and I'll talk a bit more about that, um, isn't enough to help you uh, maintain your hip function and you feel like you might be losing ground, then seeing a physiotherapist to identify, um, um, to do a thorough um, assessment and identify other triggers or problem areas and where areas where you could do um, some exercise is also helpful. Staying strong is key. Um, our muscles are what help to support our joints but they also help to distribute the weight when we're walking. So well, with every step we take, there is a, you know, a shock or a weight bearing force that goes up through our leg, up through our hips, up right up through our back. 
And if you can have strong muscles around your hip joint, that can help to dissipate some of the forces that you get when you're walking. And finally, I'll suggest that protecting your hip joint. So um, often it's painful to bend more than 90 degrees to squat down, to get down to a, a typical height of a toilet seat. So raised surfaces, um, using long handle devices so that you're not putting the hip into um, strained positions, using walking aids to unload the joint or even just to improve your balance is helpful and uh, good footwear. And even though there's not fabulous uh, research showing that the, a certain type of footwear or orthotic directly benefits people with hip arthritis, um, we know most of the guidelines that are available out there for people with hip or knee osteoarthritis um, suggest that good footwear is, is key to maintaining function. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Westby. Um, before we talk about some non-pharmacological options for managing arthritis in the hips, Dr. Lodi, I wanted to turn it to you, given your expertise in the area. So could you speak to what surgical options are available to people who are trying to manage their pain as a result of arthritis in their hips? Sure. So, um, with respect to surgical management, the first thing to do initially, even before what I've written on the slide, is to actually um, get a proper history and physical examination. We do a lot of this in medicine initially before delving into any management plan. But provided that we've done so and you've already seen someone, uh, one of the physicians about this, we then want to confirm the source of pain. We really want to know whether or not the surgical management we're planning to draft for this scenario is indeed the right thing to do. And so the first thing to do is actually look at the joint as best as possible after seeing the patient. The first way of doing so is with x-rays. I know oftentimes there are lots of sophisticated imaging available like a CT scan as well as an MRI, but it's very important to begin with x-rays, partly because it really shows you arthritis from the get-go. I've placed a couple of uh, views over there, first one on the left-hand side showing the normal hip, and it shows a very nice joint space between the ball and the socket. And on the right-hand side of this is a hip that is very arthritic. And as we see, there are lots of uh, um, uh, cyst formation or areas where the bone is uh, bone is irregular, and there's loss of joint space between the ball and the socket. And this indeed is arthritis, and it can be very quickly diagnosed based on X-rays. However, in scenarios where there is a normal uh, no, a normal X-ray, we can then go on to uh, further imaging. Now, sometimes we can have these findings, yet things can be quite elusive. And what, that, what I mean by that is we don't know exactly where the pain is coming from. The patient can have multiple different areas of pain in their leg or in their back or around their hip. How do we know that the hip joint is the actual culprit of this prior to engaging in surgical management? Well, an injection is a very good way of delineating this. If we inject and the pain goes away, even if it goes away transiently, then it is the hip joint that is uh, contributing to the pain. If the if we inject in the hip uh, in the hip and the pain does not go away, well, perhaps in that case the hip may not be the culprit for this problem. Beyond that, we always have to make sure, and I know that um, and this will be spoken about by Dr. Westby further, but we have to maximize appropriate conservative care before going on to surgical management. What that includes is activity modification physiotherapy, at least between three to six months, pain medication, there are bracing options, as well as multiple different injections, even for the treatment. And if despite all of this, the person still continues to have pain that has been thought to be from the hip, that's when we start talking about surgical management. And when we talk about surgical management, we can divide them into joint preserving surgery or joint replacing surgery. Say somebody has hip pain, but has not had arthritis as yet. In that circumstance, joint preserving surgery is an option. I have a video. I have a picture here of some uh, someone who's placed on the table right before doing keyhole or arthroscopic surgery, what we call hip arthroscopy, and this is predominantly to manage some of the uh, morphologic changes in the hip that we see, like femoroacetabular impingement. We see on this video here that there's a motorized shaver that we can use while doing keyhole surgery with multiple small different incisions around the patient's uh, hip joint to then burr out the excess bone and make, make the bony surfaces more smooth and circular. 
And this can actually uh, be imaged while we're doing the surgery with the help of a C-arm, which is the C-shaped structure seen on the top right-hand side, which can come and show us at the time of surgery what we're doing. And what, what I've done by this is, as you look in this um, bottom right-hand drawing, is basically made the ball into a much more spherical shape compared to the oblong shape that it had before to improve the range of motion as well as pain from this situation for this patient. What about on the other end of the spectrum when we have dysplasia? And I just wanted to advance the next slide, please. Again, we want... That's perfect. So when we look at the post-operative views of this patient who had a deformity of the hip, we can now see that the before and after pictures show how well the femoral head has been properly shaped so that it can move around inside the hip joint. Changing gears when we look at dysplasia, again, we need to make sure that the arthritis is not present already. These are situations that are pre-arthritic when somebody continues to have pain but has not had arthritis yet. And again, this person might be a candidate for joint preserving surgery. Now, the surgery for dysplasia is different in that we have to do open surgery in this situation because we have to reorient the socket. So what happens is that is the pelvis is cut in a few different places that allows us to reorient the socket. And as you see on the bottom right-hand side, the socket has been reoriented and placed appropriately on top of the ball or the femoral head and fixed with multiple different screws. If, however, arthritis is already present, in that case, we talk about joint replacement surgery. And the joint replacement surgery basically looks like this on the x-rays and on the left-hand side shows the cartoon. And I will briefly delve into what that is. Joint replacements are split into multiple different options, uh, sorry, multiple different parts. The first part, and I will go through this from top to bottom, is the acetabular cup. Well, this is the socket end and it goes right into the socket, followed by the liner, acetabular liner, and the femoral head. And these are the bearing surfaces. So when the, play, when the patient will be walking on the hip, those are the two areas that will be in contact with each other the most. And finally is the femoral stem, which is placed inside the femur bone or the thigh bone. The stem can be either smooth or coarse, and it depends on the tissue type or the quality of the bone, but both are very reasonable options. If the bone quality is poor or weaker, we sometimes use the smoother stem and augment it with cement. So people talk about cemented total hip replacements. Or if the bone tissue is very good, then we can use the porous coated or roughened stem, which is on the right-hand side. And what this allows is it allows for the bone to interdigitate between the stem and itself and make the actual stem part of the body. And it improves the fixation. There are many, many different bearing surfaces. And I just placed this here for completeness sake. Final decisions for this should be done with the consulting surgeon. However, I did mention that the but that the left-hand side, which is metal on metal replacements, have fallen out of favor due to their ion levels inside the bloodstream. However, there are multiple other options, for example, metal head on polyethylene liner, ceramic head on polyethylene liner, and ceramic head on ceramic liner. And all of these are very reasonable options for joint replacement surgery and should be best done on a case-by-case -case basis in discussion with the physician and the patient. Finally, I'll also mention joint resurfacing surgery. Now this surgery actually gained a lot of popularity about two decades ago, but unfortunately met with a few issues in certain, uh, certain design types. However, there are a few design types have, that have remained in the market and is still a viable option uh, to do. And it has its own benefits and risks and it is best to discuss this with, with, the, with the physician treating it. But they actually are very similar in terms of re replacement surgery in that they're changing your joint and placing metal, uh, metal parts to um, surface it. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Lodia. I can tell you people are really enjoying your, your videos and all of your pictures. So thank you for sharing those with everybody today. Now that we've covered off some of the surgical options, Dr. Westby, can you touch on some of the non-pharmacological options that are available? Thank you. And yeah, as Dr. Lodia said, conservative management is the first uh, step that we should be looking into or you should be exploring if you've been diagnosed with hip osteoarthritis. Only anywhere between 15 to 30 percent of people who develop hip osteoarthritis go on to need a total hip replacement. And that does differ by what age uh, you're diagnosed at, um, and it can differ by men and um, women. And um, men are more likely to undergo a hip replacement than women. Um, but I'm not aware, and I'll be interested if Dr. Lodia is aware, maybe when we get into the discussion later, as to whether or not we have any information or data um, specific to Canada on that. So conservative management, which should be what we call step one or first line care, are uh, outlined or recommended by a number of international guidelines. And these ones on the left hand side of this slide are those from the American College of Rheumatology. And they put these guidelines out about four years ago now. And these guidelines look at osteoarthritis for the hand, the knee and the hip. And I've put a red box around uh, those that are specific to the hip. These similar recommendations are um, also addressed in the Osteoarthritis Research Society or ORSI guidelines published in the same year. And the core first line recommended um, strategies when you've been diagnosed with hip OA are to try a structured land-based exercise program and to participate or receive education um, along the lines of uh, self-management and joint protection. And then as the American College of Rheumatology points out as well, weight loss, if you are living with obesity or overweight, um, Tai Chi is a recommended strategy as well as using a cane. So those slightly darker green recommendations um, on the left side are the strongly recommended. So that, that means there's lots of really good evidence to support these and a lot of research has been done in this area. The slightly lighter green boxes, um, which if you keep looking under hip are things like using heat or therapeutic cold cooling, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy um, interventions, the use of acupuncture, and the box kind of cuts it off a little bit there, but uh, balance training um, are conditionally recommended. So there is some evidence to support these, but it's not as strong. It hasn't been done on as many people. And in general, there's a lot less research done on these conservative treatments for hip OA than there is for knee OA. And knee OA is more common than hip OA, um, but it is, um, um, I would love to see um, more um, research specifically looking at hip osteoarthritis. So if you just go to the next slide. So what are some of these specific uh, recommendations? So exercise with a focus on strength training. I mentioned that at the beginning, how important it is to maintain strong muscles about your hip. To um, This also helps with your balance. Um, very early on in having um, being diagnosed with uh, osteoarthritis in the hip, you can notice already a change in your balance and an increased risk of falling. So maintaining um, good hip strength, um, and we do a lot of work on not just um, slow movements, but also fast um, strengthening exercises, because when you do trip or stumble, what's important is that you be able to um, contract that muscle and um, sort of catch, catch yourself before you fall. So changing up how you do your strength training is really important as well. We recommend um, programs on self-management and joint protection. There's some great educational programs available through the Arthritis Society. Um, we have here in BC through the Mary Pack Arthritis Program and the Osteoarthritis Service Integration System or OASIS offer a number of virtual or in-person education. And I'm sure most other provinces uh, provide a, a variety of options there to learn self-management skills and how to protect your hip joint. Weight loss is important, as I mentioned. Um, the ideal weight loss um, that, that's been shown in the, in the research is in, in the range of about five to seven and a half percent. More is great, but um, 
weight loss of even that amount, you, um, you'll start to notice an improvement in uh, the pain um, that you experience in your knee. Using a cane can be helpful. This is a, is a, a, a big challenge to uh, patient, a lot of the patients that I work with at the Mary Packer Arthritis Center. It's, um, they feel to some extent it's a bit of a loss of independence. Uh, I don't want to be seen using a cane. Um, I often say don't be too vain to use a cane because you can unload your hip joint by as much as 40% by using a cane in the opposite hand. Now, while it initially takes a lot of extra energy to learn how to use a cane, once you get the hang of it and you, you're using it fairly uh, fluidly, you can actually uh, conserve energy because limping wastes a lot of energy. Tai Chi I recommended and benefits of Tai Chi um, include not only some mind body um, benefits for, for pain, but also um, a big part of it is balance. And, and uh, that's key, as I said, to avoiding falls. And then the, what we call sort of the second stage of um, non-pharmacological or non-drug related options are the use of heat and cold. Now the hip joint is a very deep joint. So to use heat or cold, um, you're not really gonna be penetrating into, into the hip joint like you might with the knee joint or if you use it on your hands. But uh, heat can be very useful to muscle spasms around the, uh, around the um, hip joint or um, to the myofascial um, tissue that's around the hip joint as well. There's been some uh, evidence that acupuncture can uh, be helpful for hip pain in following uh, sort of the practices of traditional Chinese medicine in certain acupuncture points. Other, what I'm calling their electrical modalities, those are things like um, TENS machines, um, ultrasound, um, interferential current, those, some of those terms may be familiar to you. There's less evidence supporting them. There's been less research looking at them, but the research that has looked at these other modalities is not as strong, uh, doesn't have as many people in the experimental groups that have hip osteoarthritis, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and it's um, some of these guidelines that I showed you on the previous slide, they recommend against using these modalities and others provide sort of conditional recommendations. So they're usually a bit of an afterthought or what we call an adjunct. So never alone, but always maybe in addition to um, an exercise program. Manual therapy involves things like um, tractioning your hip or pull, literally pulling on your leg to sort of unload the joint. Um, the ball and socket, um, you know, moves in in uh, different directions and the hip is a very mobile joint. So sometimes some directions of movement are more restricted than others, depending on where the arthritis is. And uh, we can do techniques where we can kind of distract or traction the hip and get it moving a little easier. But again, only as an adjunct to exercise therapy. That alone will not change the arthritis or have any long lasting benefits. And then, as I mentioned previously, good footwear, because the loads we put through the foot are the loads that we transmit up our leg and up through the hip joint. And good footwear can help uh, be a shock absorber. It can help with balance and um, it can help to sort of align the whole leg um, at the level of the foot up through the knee and up through the hip. And I think that's my last slide. Oh, one more. So this is just another way of showing the same things. If you think of, I'll try this first, followed by the number two and followed by number three. Um, I can't stress enough how important it is that um, you try a course get access to supervised exercise therapy first before you consider um, a consultation with a surgeon for a hip replacement. And this is a is this is a problem in our healthcare system where the surgery and the hospitalization is covered um, through our universal health care plan, but often access to supervised physiotherapy or a physiotherapist period really varies across our provinces. And um, some of these uh, physiotherapy services, um, some of the classes or group education and exercise programs are not cheap. And that is a major barrier to people. And um, we can discuss that more, but um, I would love to see changes in um, making it easier for people with hip 
and knee osteoarthritis to access this early uh, stage of care. Yes, very good points, Dr. Westby. Um, I'd like to ask both of you this next question. Maybe I'll start with you, Dr. Lodia. Given how rapidly this field is evolving, what is exciting you about the future of treatment of arthritis in the hips? Well, I think there's a lot going on in the field of hips. And I think um, the, uh, I, I feel that lots of things can be actually looked upon uh, favorably currently and what is going to show us in the future. A lot of causation is being mapped out. So we're trying to understand what the correlation is with some of these conditions that we can identify in younger patients and how can they go on to have arthritis? So do we have a role in changing the direction of arthritis? We don't know that answer yet, but we are starting to find that out. And perhaps in the next few years or a couple of decades, we might have that answer, particularly with respect to femoral acetabular impingement or, 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 or hip impingement. And is there, is there a correlation or a causation that can be found? We're also recognizing many other reasons for hip pain in, in the younger population who don't have arthritis yet, but they could be prone to arthritis due to their problem, uh, sorry, due to their activity level. For example, micro instability of the hip where the hip does not pop out of the socket, but a lot of these patients who are high end performing athletes tend to be able to place their hips into positions that the average population cannot. And now it can actually predispose them to arthritic changes. We don't know that yet, but that is coming in the future. With respect to surgical planning, we are now gotten a lot better with respect to looking at things in three dimensions, as well as looking at the actual cartilage. You can see on the right, bottom right picture is an image of the MRI of the hip with multiple different colored maps with, with blue, yellow, and green that shows how much cartilage is remaining on the ball and socket and whether or not joint preservation surgery is worthwhile, or does the patient be a better candidate for joint replacement surgery, particularly when the x-rays are inconclusive or actually show no significant changes. We are now able to look at it even further. And then finally, navigation work, or what I like to call rise of the machines. I think there is a lot of things that play with respect to robotics, as well as navigation work, predominantly in our arena as surgeons, because now we can have a real-time assessment of where the hip is in space and actually change our management accordingly. This is one of the views on the bottom right hand side that I'm showing on one of the patients while doing surgery and we can see how much correction of the deformity we can do. Beyond that, from a hip replacement standpoint, there have been lots of robotic total joint replacement that's been talked about, but this is more so in the cutting, uh, cutting edge stages. We do not know whether that's going to impact or change the way we manage patients, but we definitely see that it is coming on the horizon. And whether or not that will change the way we deliver care remains to be seen. So there are lots of exciting things coming from the orthopedic surgery realm of this. Thank you. What about you, Dr. Westby? What are you excited about? I'm excited about those orthopedic <laughs> approaches. Um, I think for me, it's not, I'm not sure if it's excitement or, or a request uh, to see, as I said earlier, more research um, in conservative uh, management of hip osteoarthritis. It, it, there seems to be a, a focus on knee osteoarthritis. So I'd love to see more um, individuals living with hip osteoarthritis um, being part of research studies. And I think really for care, it's allowing people to have earlier access to interventions so they never get into the onto the surgical pathway. Um, there's um, every province, as I kind of alluded to, provides different levels of uh, coverage for physiotherapy and whether or not they offer programs like the GLAD program, an example of a you know six to eight week supervised exercise program. But because of the expenses associated with it, a lot of people never try those. So I'd be really excited. And I know there is some work um, at different provincial levels to um, allow people or give people access to those type of programs. And I'm going to be excited to see where those uh, lead to in the future. I think, you know, with that, let's just dive right into the Q&A that we received from this evening. And you talked about the GLAD program, Dr. Westby. Um, could you just explain that a little bit more? What is that? What what kind of programs would people be looking to uh, to access? Because um, I think a lot of people would just want to understand a little bit more about what that is. 
Sure. So the GLAD program stands for Good Living with Arthritis Denmark, because that's where it was developed. And so we have a GLAD program um, in Canada called GLAD Canada. And um, I'm sure you um, the in the chat box, you can maybe enter the website for that. It is a, a, a six week exercise, uh, plus it includes a couple of education sessions developed um, originally for people with early to moderate hip and knee osteoarthritis. And it's, um, it's a group exercise program that's offered twice a week. It's uh, supervised by trained physiotherapists, but they also have um, some chiropractors and um, some kinesiologists in some province who's, provinces who are also trained to offer this class. And it involves mostly a progressive strengthening exercise program. It's not rocket science, but it's very, um, very closely monitored. Um, exercises are safe, they're very functional, so they're things that you need to be able to do during the day um, to help you with rising from a chair, climbing stairs, um, there's a lot of focus on what they call neuromuscular control, which also helps with um, your balance and fall prevention. And there's some really good data, worldwide data, thousands and thousands of people who have now taken these GLAD programs and a lot of data just in Canada alone that show um, pretty um, significant improvements in pain, in um, sort of self-reported function, day-to-day -day activities, quality of life. And for some people, it's even um, in some countries, um, for example, in Australia, they're looking at offering the GLAD program to people that are already on a wait list for hip or knee replacement. And some um, half the group are offered the GLAD program while they're on the waiting list. And after taking that program, there's been as many as 40% of people who take themselves off the wait list and still two years later have yet to go through that hip or knee replacement. So I, I find that quite exciting. That's great. Let, let's build a little bit on the exercises related to hip osteoarthritis. And a bunch of questions here about what kinds of exercises, Dr. Westby, would you recommend? Um, people are asking, if, for example, somebody asked whether they should be avoiding weight-bearing exercises. Quite a few questions here about Aquafit, whether that will be recommended, badminton, jogging, et cetera. Could you elaborate a little bit on what kind of exercises people should be focused on? Sure. Um, so uh, totally avoiding weight-bearing exercises isn't appropriate. I think I mentioned earlier that the cartilage um, and the joint health relies on weight-bearing and cyclical sort of loading and unloading. That's how the cartilage gets its nutrition. So we do need to weight bear. That's good for the, the uh, joint itself. It's good for bone. It's good for muscle. Um, so total avoidance of weight bearing exercise isn't appropriate. High impact, um, but not so much high impact as uncontrolled impact. So contact sports um, where you're at higher risk for injury, that would be more of my concern. Um, aquatic or pool-based exercise is fantastic if it's one of many different types of exercises that you do um, because you can unload the hip joint by as much as 90% if you're up to sort of neck level water, uh, which is a lovely um, space or place to be able to move your hip with less pain. The buoyancy protects, unloads the joint, the often warm water has a pain relieving effect. Um, but because you're unloading the bone, you're not getting that healthy weight bearing that we do need um, for our bones and our joints. Um, but I think if I had to make one recommendation is absolutely do exercise, stay active with, uh, with sports that don't put you at high risk for injury um, or running into another person, something like soccer or, or football or hockey. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about all, the, all you hockey fans out there. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Lodia, we have many questions about surgery, so I'm going to ask a couple of you if that's okay. Sure. Um, the first broad question, how how would you know when you're a good candidate for surgery, i.e. when is when would it be time to be thinking about joint replacement surgery? So I think that that's a very good question because people sometimes feel they need, they, they want the replacement but may or may not be uh, the right candidate or, or the situation uh, might not be delving into that uh, that scenario. But most importantly, they need to have hip specific pain with a causative agent, which is arthritis that has been diagnosed with them. And they need to have failed non-surgical management. Oftentimes people sort of um, 
fast forward to our uh, to, to surgery way too quickly. It's important to know once we do surgery, we can't undo it. It's it's a one way street. And so I, I don't like scaring patients with that, but I do think that it's it's important to be mindful of that 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 reality. Once we cut skin for worse or better words, we can't uncut it. And so it's very important to feel at ease and at and comfortable with that concept that I have done everything I can. This indeed is hip arthritis that is bothering me, and I don't have any further options available to me. And that's when I think it's a reasonable option to consider hip surgery. I say specifically surgery because different scenarios might lend to different types of procedures, not necessarily joint replacement. But if indeed people are talking about joint replacement specifically, then it's worthwhile knowing whether or not um, they, they're, they're at their time cycle in their life that they hopefully do not require second surgery. So that's when oftentimes we do tell patients as surgeons that perhaps it's worthwhile trying activity modification and being able to manage the pain rather than treat the pain until it's a reasonable time frame so that you can have one surgery and not require a second surgery in the future. So that's actually a question that specifically came up here. So how long should you expect if you do have a hip replacement, how long should you expect it to last? So that's a, that's a good question, partly, and, and, and partly we find it difficult to answer that to patients uh, straight away because it's a moving target. Because while we are telling patients how long the current technology can last, it's, 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 it's already advancing so much more. So it's so difficult to truly say that the changes we make 20 years ago still hold now. And probably I would say that the longevity of total joint replacements have increased a lot more so in the last 20 years. Nonetheless, when we talk about how long do things last, in the last 20 years, so the technology we were using 20 years ago, which was a highly crossly, a highly crosslink polyethylene liners. I know that's a lot, that's a big word, but basically the plastic that was being used as the bearing surface actually has sur far surpassed our expectations and has not shown any wear rates at 20 years after surgery. Now, when we look at some of the laboratory data, perhaps it actually says that it might be able to last a lot longer. But do we have concrete evidence on that? We don't yet because we need all those patients who had it implanted 20 years ago to continue going through life and we go through and study them another 10 years from now, 20 years from now, to truly say, yes, indeed, it lasts 30 years or 40 years, even though the laboratory might have told us perhaps 30 to 40 years of uh, simulated walking has shown no wear rates. To actually take that with a grain of salt and actually say, well, maybe that's true, but we have concrete evidence for at least 20 years that there is no wear rates in those types of conventional total joint replacements. Right. Dr. Westby, maybe I could ask this one of you. Um, somebody here has had one hip replaced and has osteoarthritis in their other hip as well. So they're asking, is there anything they can do to protect, protect that other hip so that they can try to avoid another hip replacement? Well, it's, it's not uncommon um, with arthritis in one hip to have it in another hip. Um, and often in the attempt to protect the first hip, the second hip has done more work over the years. Uh, we bear more weight on it. We stand on one side because the other side is painful. Um, so some of the strategies I pointed out earlier around staying active, keeping your weight down, um, using uh, walking poles or a cane, even after a hip replacement in the first side, even when you don't feel you need it anymore, would be important for protecting the second hip. And um, now that you have a good, a good leg to stand on, um, being careful to distribute your weight evenly across sides and not to um, sort of favor the the new hip that you had the replacement in. It's it's the symmetry between sides, which not only helps the the healthy um, hip or the hip that has yet to be replaced, but it also helps the back because a lot of people uh, who have hip osteoarthritis also have a lot of back pain. And um, when we stand unevenly or, and lean on one side and favor it when we walk, we don't only um, increase the uh, discomfort and overuse sort of the other hip, but we also constrain the back. Okay. 
Okay. Could you elaborate for a second about canes and walking poles? You just mentioned both. Is one preferred over the other? I'm happy if people use either. So it depends on the purpose. You can unload or take more weight off a hip joint with a cane, um, ideally in the opposite hand, because when we walk, we swing our arms opposite to our legs. Um, but it, it's it's okay as well if someone wants to use it in this on the same side as as the painful hip, but that does unload the hip more than walking poles, those Nordic walking poles. Um, so if the purpose is to take the weight off because every step hurts, um, then a cane is better. If the purpose is to improve your balance and your confidence in walking, uh, walking poles can be very effective. Um, if that gets people out, it's kind of like a tripod effect with a cane, with poles in both hands and then one leg on the ground when we walk. It gives us more confidence, more stability. And if that gets people outdoors, if it gets people walking and more active, then that's also recommended. And it's often a good first step for when someone doesn't really feel like they're ready to progress to a cane. Okay, so I'm going to actually ask you just to clarify that piece about how to use a cane because we've had a few people ask that question. So if somebody has, for example, osteoarthritis in their right hip, how should they be using a cane? So there's lots of varieties of canes out there. Canes have really evolved in terms of their look and their fit and their feel. It's not a traditional sort of just curved handle cane anymore. So finding a cane that has a nice um, grip and a nice padding for your arm is important for your hand is important. To measure the height of a cane, you stand in the in um, with the footwear or the shoes that you normally wear with your arm hanging down at your side, and the top of the cane should come to your wrist crease. Uh, there, oh, there we go, <laughs> to your wrist <laughs> crease. That's where the cane should go to. And then when you put your place your hand on top of the cane, you'll have a slight bend in your elbow. So that's the right height. So if you have arthritis in your right hip you use it, hold the cane in your left hand. And every time you place your right foot forward, the cane swings forward in your left hand. So it takes a bit of practice. It feels a bit awkward at first. We don't always realize, well, we're already doing that. We're swinging our left arm forward when our right foot goes forward and vice versa. So with a little bit of practice, um, we can usually get the hang of it. I tell people to practice indoors where they feel safe at a nice slow pace and just really work on the, the pattern until it, you feel confident before you're going out someplace for a longer walk or someplace where you feel more vulnerable. Um, and, and as I said earlier, initially, it may feel quite tiring to learn how to use this cane and put that, you know, that mind body control. But once you get the hang of it, it actually helps to conserve energy. That's great. Dr. Lodia, maybe I could ask you, um, is there any relationship between osteoarthritis in the hip and in the knee? And clearly we have some people on this call who, who have both. So oftentimes the arthritis in the hip or pain from the hip can be masked and instead the patients uh, complain of pain in the knee. And partly it's because there is a cross connection with the nerves that actually give sensation to the hip joint and the knee joint. And so when, when somebody might have pain in their hip, they might be coming to us and saying, well, I have pain in my knee. And indeed, when you actually examine them and get further imaging, you actually find that it is their hip that's causing the problem. It's one of those things, again, that can be really helpful by injecting the joint that we think is the problem and seeing whether or not that pain goes away. And if indeed it does go away, then wherever we inject it is probably where the problem is coming from. The reverse I have found less likely to be the case. So oftentimes if somebody has knee arthritis, if it, it is indeed their knee that hurts, it does not, it doesn't spare the knee and hurts in the hip. But the reverse, um, but, 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 the, but the one way I have mainly seen is when the person has hip arthritis, they do complain of their knee pain as well. Now, are both of them related? That's a little bit difficult to say because both of them are the two biggest uh, weight bearing joints. And so any weight that goes through the hip most certainly goes through the knee because that's the same weight that's required for the person to propel forward when they're walking. And so, yes, there is a connection with respect to how much that person has used that joint and how much wear and tear there is in that joint. Whether, whether one affects the other because of the gait changes, 
it may also have a role in how symptomatic you can get. So for example, if somebody has hip pain and they begin limping and that changes the way they walk, perhaps the mild amount of knee arthritis might become symptomatic as well. So the knee may have not been the primary problem up until now, but because the hip pain became so severe that their gait changed and the way they walked changed, that was enough to tip them off into a situation where the knee pain that was otherwise not there becomes now a problem as well. So I've also seen that scenario. And that has to do with a lot of mechanics or the way the joints are being used in that particular person, which is why oftentimes, again, I'll put a plug in for Dr. Wesby that physiotherapy and actually changing some of those um, gait profiles can actually help by overall strength and conditioning of the entire lower extremity. Okay. What about somebody who has uh, been advised that they need a, both a hip replacement and a knee replacement? How do you go about prioritizing what to do first? So typically my answer to that is initially how much is which one bothering that particular person? Oftentimes when there are two, two systems at play, one usually takes precedence over the other in that person's mind or in that person's uh, overall well-being or outlook of life. And that oftentimes is the first thing to manage. However, sometimes people might say both are equally hurting me, doctor, which one do you suggest? Then the rule of thumb is actually going to the proximal or the closer to the center of the body first. Because so in the hip and knee standpoint, it would be the hip that should be managed before the knee if both the hip and knee are equally hurting the person. Because in order for you to rehabilitate the knee, you need a good hip. The reverse may be less likely to be true because you can still rehabilitate the hip first with, with a arthritic knee. But if you have an arthritic hip, that will preclude any rehabilitation of a total knee replacement because it's difficult for the person to walk or move their knee, which is required after a knee replacement to, to get optimal results if their hip is still bothering them. And so in those circumstances, it's worthwhile going from top to bottom. Hmm, that's great, very practical. Also, the other thing I'll say is that because sometimes the pain in the knee may be from the hip, if we manage the hip, some of the milder knee arthritic symptoms tend to go away or become manageable to the point where people might not want their knee replaced anymore because the hip is doing such a good job. Thank you. That was really, really thorough. Um, Dr. Westby, maybe I could ask you uh, some questions here about how do you go about bracing a hip? And what does a hip brace look like? Can you do that? We do not use any braces for the hip. That is a difficult joint to brace on like the knee or an ankle. Um, so I can't really comment on, on having any experience. It's um, it's such a large joint and it's um, where it's situated sort of in the body and the pelvis would make it very difficult to actually stabilize the joint or change the alignment. And I don't find it's as much of a problem because of the anatomy of the joint, the ball and socket sort of design as it is for like a knee joint where um, it um, can actually sort of um, bend sort of from side to side and a brace can help to control that movement. I don't know if um, Dr. Lodia has any comments on that, but there's not as much evidence or research around using braces for hips as it is as there are for knee joints. Interesting, uh, interesting question, partly because we are actually trying to study that very situation more now. There, there are a few hip braces in the market, but you're you're right, uh, um, Dr. Westby. I don't know whether there is any evidence for its usage. There are certain unloader hip braces that are available with a lumbar support and sort of like a half shorts um, velcroed um, spot around the thigh that could be used with a with a dial around around the hip joint. I do use them particularly for joint preserving surgery when I don't want someone to move in a certain position. But that's mainly for post-operative reasons, not so much for prevention or, or management of arthritis from a non-surgical standpoint. While there are certain braces available in the market, again, I don't know whether that should be the primary management option for patients, but just to know that they do exist and it is an option to explore as an adjunct, I think is what I would tell patients when they ask me about this very question too. 
And Dr. Lodia, in that post-surgical stage, how long should people expect to be undergoing recovery after their hip replacement surgeries? So typically with hip replacements, uh, it, it is a reasonably sized surgery, but more more recently, there's been lots of headway about same day discharge. Um, and so people are not staying in hospital long. I think that's become the name of the game in the 21st century as to how to reduce the amount of time in hospital, because that is the biggest harbinger for, for improvements after surgery. So we are making a lot of headway on that and trying to improve post-operative pain. But with respect to returning back to regular function, that tends to be a bit variable depending on how well the person was doing beforehand, what their overall health state was and what other factors were at play. But say there was none of that and it's it's a straightforward single hip joint that was a problem and an otherwise very healthy fit individual and they go through a hip replacement. Typically around two to three months, people are, are walking reasonably occasionally requiring a cane or an assistive device, but still feeling and understanding that there has been something done. But around six to eight months of time, people are usually by and large feeling good. And about one year out, we use, we use this thing called a um, um, forgetting joint score, which is you forget which joint was operated on. And that is the ultimate uh, sort of understanding of how well someone has done and that around one year tends to be when people start to feel that. Is when you ask them, which joint did you rip? Oh yeah, let me think about that. And the fact that they actually have to think about that is the best sort of outcome that we can hope for because that means in their mind, we've succeeded. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, Dr. Westby, we've had a few follow-up questions about your explanation around using canes and really in particular, people who have arthritis in their hands and in their wrists, do you have any tips for them who are trying to navigate that as well as trying to use a cane. Yeah, that's a challenge because you, you you're basically essentially taking more weight through your your hand and your wrist to offload offload your hip. Um, certainly, the canes that have a large padded grip can help um, with the hand, especially if it's a matter of gripping uh, the cane if the tight grip is painful. Um, there are also types of canes that have like um, a gutter that you can rest your forearm on instead of taking all the load through your wrist joint. And um, that those are also an option so that you can sort of leave the hand fingers and the wrist out of the out of the weight bearing. Um, and those are some you can buy canes like that or you can buy adaptations to canes that sit like a little trough that sits on top of the cane. So that would be my recommendation. The other option also, if it's uh, mostly one hand that's painful is obviously to switch to the other hand or to, um, to spread the load over two hands and two wrists. So if you're trying to unload the, you know, your right hip, use a cane in both hands um, and then you're distributing the stress that goes through both hands and wrists and minimizing it on just one. Okay. Dr. Lodia, question here, can your arthritis return after you've had a joint replacement? Well, in theory, when we're doing a joint replacement, we're actually replacing your cartilage. So it can't, it cannot return to that particular joint because the very entity that's causing the arthritis has now been replaced with non-living parts. What I will say that is that pain may return depending on how well someone might have been able to use those components. And so, because those components now are not living, they have no biologic value. So any wear and tear that happens now on them is permanent. And so that can create issues in the future. But again, as I said earlier, a lot of the wear rates or, the, or how, how much a substance is wearing out, we have now gradually improved significantly in the last two, two decades. So that is something that we are looking with cautious optimism on in the future. Perfect. And I'm going to end with a very practical question from somebody who has had a double hip replacement for you, Dr. Lodia. And the question is, will I buzz when I go through the detectors, metal detectors at the airport? More than likely, yes, I would say, because the amount of metal used in the joint replacement tends to be always stinging, uh, depending on how much, uh, depending on which airport it is and how much they have placed their their sort of trackers on. But more than likely, most uh, mo most places will ding with, with the amount, sure amount of metal that's in there. That's not right. a problem. It's just something that exists. Right. <laughs> okay.
Okay, well, thank you both so much for sharing all of your knowledge with us today. Um, we really enjoyed that. Uh, we would like to take a few moments to get the audience's feedback on today's presentation. So for those of you who are watching on Zoom, you'll see a poll question pop up on your screen with some answer options. So click on the response that does reflect your thoughts. I feel more knowledgeable and empowered after attending this webinar. Agree, disagree, et cetera. We will also be sending you an evaluation form when we email the recording of the slides. Uh, so you, if you weren't able to access that poll question, don't worry, you will have the opportunity to give us some feedback at that time. We do use the survey feedback to shape our future Arthritis Talks webinars and value your input, so please do reply if you can. Once again, we are grateful to Pfizer, United Way Winnipeg, and our other partners for their financial support of this event. And October 12th is World Arthritis Day, and across Canada, many buildings and landmarks will be lit up blue to stand in solidarity with people living with arthritis. So we really do encourage you to help build awareness around arthritis by wearing blue. Visit some of our participating sites, take a picture of yourself, and amplify that on social media by using the message hashtag blue for arthritis. We will be back on November 2nd for Arthritis Talks, Integrative Emerging Non-Surgical Approaches for Arthritis with Dr. Gordon Cope. So more information and a link to register will be included in an email to you tomorrow. So that concludes tonight's Arthritis Talks. On behalf of all of us, thank you for joining us today. Please stay well. <laughs>